Hello, and welcome to Denton's Tales of the Viking Age. Now, I'm not, I'm not going off the raiding, raiding or anything. Uh, this is just to set the, the tone of the piece, if you like. So, I shall dispense with the prop and begin. In this video, I'll be looking at the legacy of the Vikings today, or more correctly, the legacy of the Norse people since that legacy derives mostly from those who, who were not Vikings in the correct sense of that word. They were Danes, Norwegians, or Swedes, rather than Vikings as such, and left us a considerable cultural and linguistic legacy. And that legacy is part of our lives today. For example, every day you will use words that have come down to us from Old Norse, some of them unchanged. But, but, but before we, we get into the, the legacy, left us by the Norse, or the Vikings if you prefer, which is after all what this video is about, a few words on the general misconceptions that abound about them are in order. I've talked about some of those misconceptions in other videos, of course, but they are relevant, I think, here as well. And not everyone will have seen the, the other videos. The considerable contribution of the Norse people to the history and culture of Europe, and indeed beyond the countries of Europe, and the legacy they left us is so often overlooked some aspects of it largely unknown to anyone other than those with a specific interest in the subject who have gone to the trouble of researching it. Misconceptions of them abound in the popular mind. They are frequently remembered simply for things they never actually did, such as wearing horned helmets, or doing nothing but raiding, pillaging, raping anything that was female and still alive at the time, as well as burning everything flammable they could get their hands on. The violence of their raids is stressed constantly, at the expense of other things, and, and that gives a rather false picture of those times, seeming to portray the British Isles in particular as a peaceful land where everyone lived happily in total peace. Birds sang, the sky was blue, unrestrained, joy and gladdery reigned all around, until the barbarous Vikings descended on them, raping and killing and looting, shattering the beauty and peace of the land. <laughs> oh, the horror! Yes, well, <clears throat> nothing could actually be further from the truth. For centuries, Britain had indeed been a relatively peaceful land, enjoying the Pax Romana, a peace guaranteed by the greatest military force of the ancient world, the Roman legions. But once the mighty legions left, returning to mainland Europe to defend the crumbling Roman Empire, the land descended into chaos, warring British tribes struggling for power, and then Germanic invaders arrived, the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes driving the original Celtic people into Wales and Cornwall, the newcomers gradually becoming the Anglo-Saxons. Not a lot changed. Warfare was pretty much constant. Anglo-Saxon England was in a state of well, constant conflict. The Welsh raided into Mercia. The Scots came over the long-abandoned Roman wall and raided Northumbria. Saxon kings and thanes squabbled amongst each other over land. And in Ireland, various petty kings and chieftains fought over the same. The Vikings were just the latest raiders to arrive, though by far the most formidable, and hardly any more brutal than the others. They just did it with more flair, you might say. Nobody else had those lovely ships with the big dragons on the front. But history has chosen to largely ignore that fact. They are seen as disheveled, scruffy savages, with unkept hair, a total lack of morality or human decency, who had no interests or desires other than raping and killing, making their living solely by thieving and robbery taking the fruits of the labour of others for themselves rather than working for it. Now, that is about as true as saying that, well, all Scotsmen wear kilts, or every German dresses in little leather shorts and has a hat with the arse end of a badger sticking out of it. The Norse peoples were far more democratic in their form of government than most other nations at that time. They had a very clearly defined legal and moral code. Women, for example, were well protected against molestation of any kind. Even touching a woman without her consent was a serious matter. And they had far greater rights and privileges than women in the rest of Europe or the Middle East, such as the ability to divorce their husbands, own land, and so forth. They were highly respected, nor were they stigmatized as unclean or disgusting and shut away from society during their menstrual cycle, as they were in other lands. Honor was valued above everything else. Things like theft, rape, breaking one's word, branded a man as unworthy. Uh, but um, Viking raiders, uh, didn't they rape and steal, uh, I hear you say? 
Yes, they did. But see, raiding wasn't seen as theft. You risked your life when you went off raiding. That was honorable. You could get killed. You fought for what you took. But whacking someone over the head from behind the club and running off with their purse before they could get up, well, that wasn't. That would bring nothing but shame and dishonor. Women taken during raids were spoils of war and thus could be raped by their captors. They were their women. But Norse women were a different matter. They were our women and touched them at your peril. A Norseman never broke his word unless he wanted to be regarded as the lowest of the low, a deceitful person lacking honour. When Ragnar Lothbrok foolishly made a drunken oath to conquer England with only two ships, despite the obvious impossibility of actually doing that, since a ship could carry on average between 40 to 60 men, and any attempt to do so would result in his own death, he nevertheless had to do it. He'd taken an oath, and to break it would brand him a coward, a liar, a man without honour. He had to do it. He had no choice. And, of course, the result was his death at the hands of King Ayla of Northumbria. Now, that was in stark contrast to the noble Christian knights of medieval Europe, whose keeping of their sacred knightly vows was, uh, well, lax in the extreme, hardly living up to the high and noble ideals which the church expected from them, but seldom got. They took solemn vows, of course, to honour women and protect the weak and innocent, but they had a great tendency to rape and murder on a fairly impressive scale, sometimes slaughtering entire towns, even decorating their helmets on one occasion with wounds cut from the bodies of nuns when they were supposed to be fighting Muslims in the Holy Land. Ah, then, of course, they uh, would commit assorted atrocities, confess their sins, get absolution, and start all over again, and again, and again the confessional being used as a sort of get-out-of-jail card, which they played rather frequently. Nor was violence the only way disputes were settled among the Norse, though violence often occurred right enough, as could be expected when people were walking around with swords and knives on their belt. But many problems were resolved quite peacefully at the Althing, the gathering at which disputes were raised, laws enacted, problems discussed, and decisions made, and so forth. Far from being disheveled and unkept, the Norse were considerably more concerned about their appearance than most other peoples of that time. Grooming was very important to both men and women. Beautifully made combs were among the most frequently found objects in Norse graves. Hair, male and female, and beards would be carefully combed, braided or plaited, and decorated with beads or silver hair rings. The 10th century Arab writer, Achwent ibn Fadlan, being astonished that the Norse combed their hair every day. They also washed their hands and faces every day, and they bathed once a week. What an unheard of thing elsewhere. Well, people might only bathe once a year, maybe, maybe twice if they were what today we would call clean freaks. The Anglo-Saxons, of course, were totally baffled by such bizarre behaviour, actually recording their astonishment at Norse cleanliness in the famous Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, especially the really weird Norse habit of changing their underclothing. Well, that made no sense to the Anglo-Saxons. After going to the trouble of putting it on, and why keep taking it off again? Up, down, up, down. You could do that when you had the annual bath. <laughs> it's fair to say that being in a confined space on a very hot summer day with a Norse man or woman would have been much more comfortable than had you been with their Anglo-Saxon counterparts, or anyone else in Europe for that matter. The Norse, when they went Viking, which I'll come to in a moment, were no more brutal than most other peoples of the time, as I've said. And actually, they did far more farming, fishing, building, manufacturing various types of goods, trading, having children, and so on, than they ever did raiding. Though the popular image of them is that every Norseman was a raider, every single one of them. That's all they did. All they did 365 days a year, sailing around in ships with dragon heads on them, looting and raping anything that actually had a pulse. Somebody had to stay behind to look after all the various tasks of everyday life. And trading was often just as important, sometimes even more so than raiding. Getting what you wanted without risking being killed in the process, and often getting, well, more than you would have got from a raid. With some of the longest, most difficult voyages they undertook, not being to raid and plunder. They were to the markets of distant Constantinople or Baghdad, there to trade amber and furs, and beautiful jewellery, and slaves, of course, such journeys involving navigating the rivers of Europe from the Baltic down to the Black Sea, often porting their ships overland from one river to another. 
Now, if you've ever tried dragging, or indeed carrying, a ship overland, you'll know it's not a task one would particularly relish just to pass the time you know, on a slow day. And, of course, the Norse people weren't Vikings. No. no, Nobody, in fact, was a Viking. Because while you could go Viking, you couldn't be a Viking. Viking, or Viking of an old Norse, meant a person who got in a ship, went somewhere in it, and did something or other when they got wherever they got to be it raiding, trading, founding settlements, or just sitting around scratching their arse. But they had to go somewhere and do something when they got there, or they weren't Vikings. As long as they stayed away from ships, they were Danes, Norwegians, or Swedes. They were Norsemen or Norse women, but Vikings they were not. No one ever called them Vikings. They didn't even call themselves Vikings, other than in that very limited sense of sailing off in a ship, because Viking wasn't a term of nationality. It was something you did. And that word didn't even come into the English language until centuries after the last longship had rotted away to dust. If you'd run into an Anglo-Saxon village in the 9th century and shouted, THE VIKINGS ARE COMING! Everyone would have said, so, uh, who the hell are the Vikings? Some kind of traveling entertainers? Or they bring jugglers or, or dancing dogs? But had you said, the Norsemen are coming, or the Danes are here, well, everyone would have scattered like cockroaches when you turn the light on. In the popular television series, Vikings, the principal characters, Ragnar and Lagatha, start off in episode one as Norse farmers. Nothing more. He only becomes a Viking when he sets off in his ship to go on a raid, and she doesn't do it until later in the show when she joins him on another raid. But once they set foot back in Scandinavia, once they leave the ship behind, they're no longer Vikings. They're farmers once again. Of course, the term Viking has now come into popular usage to describe anything and everything Norse, be it art, dress, weapons. Everything is Viking. Viking culture, Viking religion, Viking ships. When the only thing that was genuinely Viking was the connection with a ship. Though even then, only in terms of those who sailed in it, not the ship itself. The ship was not a Viking ship. It was a ship that was carrying some people who were Vikings. There was no Viking clothing or Viking art. Well, there's plenty of Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish clothing and art. But I suppose we are stuck with that incorrect term as an overall descriptive name for the Norse people of those days, and everything since that is connected with them, whether we like it or not. So, having said all that at some considerable length, we now come to the legacy left to us by the Norse. I'm sure there are many people who would be surprised by the extent of Norse influence on our modern, everyday lives, particularly with regard to language. Did you know that out of some 5,000 basic words in the English language, 20% of them are so-called loan words from Old Norse, and a considerable number in Irish Gaelic also, many of them unchanged from the pronunciation used over a thousand years ago? In Irish, for example, the words for a marketplace, a penny, a button, all come from Old Norse, as does the word for a boat, as well as things connected with it, such as the sails, rudder, and the anchor. All those names in Irish derive from Old Norse. And brogue, meaning a shoe, comes from the Old Norse, brogue. In English, words such as skull, knife, die, cake, ugly, ball, law, as well as bylaw, mire, skill, stake, flat, guest, Skin, leg, scrap, crawl, saga, ugly, loft, mistake, both, birth, bread, root, ship, same and give. All those words derive from Old Norse, which also greatly influenced uh, English grammar and syntax and gave us pronouns like them, they and their. Husband derives from Norse, meaning the master of the house. Sleuth from a word meaning to track or to trail. Skirt, which meant a shirt and thing, which was the Norse word for a meeting place where topics were discussed and laws enacted, as I've mentioned. Egg comes from the Norse egg, meaning, well, meaning an egg. The list goes on, many words being exactly the same as the Old Norse originals, thing, saga, or egg, for example. Blunder comes from blunder, meaning to stumble. Call from kala, to cry out loudly. And cast from kasta, meaning to throw something. Club derives from the Norse klubber. Uh, ransack from ransaka to search something. Slaughter from slatterer, which meant to butcher. Scare comes from skira. Bulk from bulky, meaning cargo. Happy derives from hap, which meant to have good luck. And dregs from dreg, meaning sediment. We get muck from the word for cow dung. And rotten is almost exactly the same, rotten. Thrift comes from, well, 
first to be prosperous. And farewell from the Old Norse farewell. Old Norse and Old English were similar in many ways, uh, both deriving from North Germanic uh, peoples. Enough that, enough that people could have learned each other's languages reasonably easily in Britain. And for a considerable period of English history, Old Norse, most frequently the Danish version of it, would have been well known to the Anglo-Saxons who lived in close proximity. They would have been able to understand each other reasonably well. Certain sounds in English come exclusively from Old Norse as the two languages merged to some extent. The SK sound in words such as sky or skull was never found in Old English. The same for the hard G as in get or give. Again, a clear indication of the Norse influence, since that sound was not one used in Old English. In Ireland, town names that end in Ford come from the word fjord, meaning an inlet, indicating former Norse settlements that grew into centres of population, Waterford or Wexford, for example. Or in England, those that contain the word firth from the same Norse root, the firth of Clyde, Solway Firth, and the firth of Ford. Towns in England that end in Thorpe, such as Scunthorpe, Cleethorpes, or Bishopthorpe, from Thorpe meaning a village or a small settlement. Any town that ends in B, B Y or B I E, indicates a Norse settlement. Derby, Rugby, Selby, Grimsby, for example. As do those ending in A Y, Y or E Y, Orkney, Lundy, and Ramsey. Uh, Thoft is uh, another uh, Norse suffix, meaning a homestead, such as Lowestoft. And Lang is also Norse, meaning long, as in King's Langley or Great Langton. So the Norse legacy is very considerable as far as place names go, as well as words. I suppose one could say that Old Norse is only a semi-dead language, unlike a truly dead language like, say, Aramaic, Babylonian or Ancient Egyptian, since Icelandic, a language directly descended from Old Norse, is very close to it, more so than modern Danish, Norwegian or Swedish. So close that uh, a Viking of the 10th century brought in a time machine to Iceland today would be able to understand it reasonably well. Since, though modern Icelandic pronunciation does often differ from Old Norse, many words are almost exactly the same, and others close enough that he'd get the meaning. That's not the case with Old English. If you brought, say, Alfred the Great to modern-day England, nobody would know what he was talking about. But let us, uh, let us continue. Many surnames in Ireland are of Norse rather than Irish origin, among them MacBurney, the son of Bjorn, or Macauliffe, the son of Olaf, MacManus, son of Magnus, and Reynolds comes from Ragnall. Doyle, a very common name and probably considered to have nothing to do with Vikings, is actually from an Irish name for the um, Danes, a descriptive Gaelic term which comes from the Irish dove, dark, and gal, foreigner, meaning the son of the dark foreigner. Or, in other words, the son of a Dane, who were called the Dark Foreigners, the Norwegians being referred to as the Fair Foreigners, though I'm sure there were any number of Irish terms for them that were rather more obscene than descriptive, at least in the early days when the Viking raids were commonplace. Any Irish name ending in son is probably of Norse origin, as are Magna, Halpin, Broderick, Coppinger, Grimes, Harold, Cotter, Trant, Lamont, Kitterick, McKeever, Kettle and Dromgoole. And a little seaside town just north of Dublin called Skerries takes its name from an Old Norse word meaning a rock in the sea, presumably due to a rocky outcrop uh, into the sea beside the town. One present-day seafaring legacy of the Norse in Ireland are the small ships known as the Yawl, which are found around Ackle Island off the coast of County Mayo. Originally pointed at bow and stern like a Viking longship, these craft were inspired by the considerable shipbuilding skills of the Norse and serve today as a living link with the Vikings in Ireland. Another Irish link uh, with the Norse legacy is the area of Dublin, north of the River Liffey, known as Oxmantown. There were some Norse Gaels who regarded themselves as different from the fully native Irish Gaels, the Gael Gaels, if you like, calling themselves the Ostmen, or the men from the east, while the others were the Vestmen, the men from the west. And these Ostmen founded a settlement on the north side of the river, outside the city walls, which lay on the south side. It was called Ostmanatun the homestead of the Eastmen, and it was a distinct district of Dublin for centuries, even after the city spread out across the river to the north, its name gradually being corrupted to Oxmantown as it is today. I used to live in that area, as it happens, and the Norse influence, uh, influence is still very apparent today just by looking at the street signs. You will find um, Ivor Street, as it's pronounced here, Harold Road, Ostman Place, Olaf Road, Sigurd Road, Thor Place, 
Viking Road, Viking Place, Oxmantown Road, and Citric Road, all within a very small area of the city. In the Isle of Man, the Parliament, the Tinwald, the oldest continuous parliamentary assembly in the world, as it happens, takes its name from the Norse Thinwala, or Assembly Place. Many Manx names also derive from Norse, Kinvig, uh, Cormod, Crenel, and Corkill. And the island's highest mountain, Snæfell, means snow mountain in Norse. In Wales, too, Old Norse names turn up, though Wales was not settled to any degree by the Vikings compared with uh, England and Ireland. The island of Anglesey having been Anglesey, while Swansea comes from Sveins E, said to have been named for King Svein Forkbeard. When Christians celebrate Christmas, they are actually following many Norse traditions rather than actual Christian ones. Pagan symbolism often adapted and encouraged by the early church to assist with the conversion of pagans who would more readily accept Christian ideas if they resembled things the pagans were already used to. The Christmas ham, the Yule log, the Christmas tree, wreaths hung on doors, none of those things are actually Christian in origin. They come from old Norse paganism, something I'll be talking about in detail in another video. One considerable legacy the Norse left across Europe was a mixture of culture and ideas, new ways of doing things that resulted from their widespread trading expeditions. Incredible journeys for that day and age that took them from Iceland or Dublin to Constantinople and Baghdad, even acquiring items from as far east as India, bringing back examples of art and new attitudes to their homelands in Scandinavia or to Ireland and Britain. While the reverse was true in the distant lands they visited, aspects of northern European culture and art being added to that of those countries. While it's not possible, of course, to identify everything that may have resulted from the Norse expeditions across the world, such extensive voyaging could not fail to produce a considerable exchange of ideas. In an age when most people knew little of what went on, uh, what went on perhaps in the, in the next town or city, and nothing at all about other countries, even that those countries existed, the Norse brought an exchange of knowledge and goods that would have been impossible otherwise. Scandinavian burial sites have revealed huge numbers of Arab artifacts, for example, including over 200,000 silver coins that were minted in the Middle East. And in Ireland, Arab coins, as well as Anglo-Saxon ones, were the staple currency brought back by the Norse traders. And that continued right up to 997 AD, when the first genuine Irish coins were minted in Dublin by the Norse king Sidric Olafton, known as Silkbeard. Were it not for Norse trading, there wouldn't have been any Arab coins in Ireland, nor indeed many other things from uh, distant lands, some exotic, some humble and ordinary, but all the result of the far-flung voyages of the dragon ships. But that, 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 that's a slight exaggeration for effect. Vessels on trading expeditions would have been highly unlikely to have fitted the dragon or sea serpent heads to their high prows, since that would have indicated a hostile intent, not the best way to start negotiations for a fair price in Constantinople. And many specialised trading ships wouldn't even have had such a thing in the first place. Those heads were reserved for the warships, and even then they were usually removed when approaching friendly harbours, so as not to upset the spirits that guarded the land, and whose protection was considered very important. No warship would have entered its home port, or any friendly harbour for that matter, with shields hung along the sides and ferocious beast heads on the prow and stern posts, and trading vessels wouldn't have had them to begin with. Traders would, of course, have carried weapons, but they wouldn't have displayed them in the way a warship would when it was coming in for a raid. Only the Roman Empire ever came close to the Norse, as far as worldwide influence went prior to the so-called Age of Discovery in later centuries. But even the Romans they never got further west than Wales, while the Norse travelled far out across the Atlantic, to the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, and to those parts of America that we know today as Newfoundland and New Brunswick. They sailed the Mediterranean Sea, landing to raid and sometimes trade in Morocco, Spain, Italy and Sicily, reached the Middle East, trading in Baghdad and Constantinople, and later expeditions sailed into the Caspian Sea. They reached what is now Iran, Azerbaijan and Dagestan. They travelled along the river systems of Europe, the Volga, Danube, Dnieper, the Don and the Rhine, from the, from the Baltic down to the Black Sea, porting their ships overland to change the rivers. They established settlements in England, Ireland, France, the Isle of Man, the Orkney and Shetland Islands, Iceland, Greenland, Sicily, briefly in Newfoundland, in what would become Russia and Belarus, both countries actually named for them from Rus, a word meaning to row a boat. And the Norse were very open to the culture of other races, integrating with them often very, very quickly. Um, 
it, this, this was a common feature of North settlement, that they would integrate with the people that they had settled among, as was the case in Ireland, where eventually there was little difference between Norse and Gael. Something that was not the case centuries later, when any thought of integration between European settlers and the native peoples of America and Africa was, well, it was unthinkable. In that attitude, the Norse were far more tolerant and liberal than their 18th and 19th century counterparts. In 10th century Ireland, King Citric Silkbeard, uh, who I have mentioned already, was the son of a Norse nobleman and a Celtic Irish princess, something that would have been seen as, well, an abomination almost in any of the later colonial empires. Dash it all, old chap. I mean, one, one would hardly lower oneself to marry one of those, uh, those native persons. <laughs> Disgusting. Given their attitudes and the vast extent of their voyaging, the exchange of ideas, culture, and work practices that grew out of that must have been considerable and went a great way to shaping the Europe we know today. So it, it's fitting that we think of the Vikings not as Vikings in the raiding and pillaging sense of that word, but as traders, explorers, settlers, merchants, shipbuilders, craftsmen, and ordinary people going about the everyday activities of family life, marrying and having children, sitting around the fire, telling sagas to pass the time on a long winter night and value their legacy rather than always seeing them just as savage, murderous raiders, leaping off dragon-headed ships and destroying everything in sight, seeing them simply as, well, as vikinger. That was obviously an integral part of what they were, yes, but only a part, not the sum total of everything that made them what they actually were, the Norse people. To see them only as brutal raiders is, well, it's rather like seeing a house as just the front wall ignoring the side and back walls as, as well as everything inside. Sadly, I suppose, given the deep-rooted ideas about them that linger in the popular mind, planted there by highly inaccurate movies, TV shows, and countless books, they will continue to be seen by many people in the context of rape and plunder, horned helmets, and fearsome-looking dragon-headed ships. You know, I, I seldom watch so-called Viking-themed movies. At least, I watch them only as far as the first horned helmet appears. Likewise, quite a few documentaries that start with statements like the brutal scourge of Europe or the terrors of the Dark Ages, because I know where they're going after that. Few authors of novels seem to bother to put any great research into their books, at least those I've seen, since it doesn't require great historical accuracy to write a good story. The readers probably won't know all that much about the intricate details of it anyway, and close enough is good enough in many cases. But I will mention a couple that stand out in that regard. Authors of fiction who bother to get it right when it comes to historical detail. One is Bernard Cornwell, whose series of novels entitled The Saxon Stories are a masterpiece of accurate historical detail used in a fictional context, set during the wars between the Danes and King Alfred the Great. And while well, given the nature of the tales, they concentrate almost entirely on the violent warfare aspects of that, that time rather than the domestic and they are written mostly from the Saxon point of view, they are still outstanding pieces of historical fiction set in the Viking Age. And you could learn a great deal about life in 9th and 10th century England by reading his books. The other is Amalia Carosella, whose brilliant novel, Daughter of a Thousand Years, I recently had the great pleasure of reading. A wonderfully intertwined side-by-side -side tale of two women who live a thousand years apart. One, a teacher in 21st century America. The other, Freudus Erikstatir, the daughter of Eric the Red in the 10th century, and their respective struggles to maintain their faith in the gods of Osgarda among the very anti-pagan people who surround them. The book's chapters alternating between Greenland and the Norse settlement in North America and a small American town of the present day. Apart from being just a great, and I found totally riveting story in itself, she writes about the Viking Age with remarkable insight, understanding, and obvious affection, and her attention to historical detail is superb. I was sorry when I got to the last page. I wanted more. And that is the sign of a good book. So, with that, um, I will say farewell. Goodbye till next time.